Good evening. Bonjour. Bonjour, everyone. Thank you for coming this evening. It is my pleasure to welcome you this evening to the Power Plant Contemporary Art Gallery for a special conversation with artist Jen Aiken. We're thrilled to have Jen here with us today to talk about her exhibition, The Same Thing Looks Different. Let's start with the beginning of the exhibition. Why was it so important to show lexicon first? The idea was to kind of have a a sort of prelude or like an overture, like this kind of zone that you would be immersed into that would kind of shift your state of mind and, and give you kind of more focus so that then when you opened out into the sculptural space, you kind of had maybe left some of that frantic, distracted energy that, of the most of your day. And the idea kind of came from uh, something called the Fuerle Collection, which is in Berlin, which is a an exhibition space, like a kind of permanent collection in a bunker in Berlin. Mm -hmm. And they have this sort of old Chinese art and contemporary art, um, but the whole space is kind of, they make you go through this John Cage piece and, and sit in the dark for seven minutes or something and listen to the sound piece, and then you're allowed in to see the work. And I, that, I, that kind of blew me away, this sort of threshold, like to, you know, shake off the outside world and enter into this other zone. Mm -hmm. And what was the process of making this new work? Um, and what have you learned from it? As I know, it's something that you've worked on for a few years and you were planning to, to complete it years ago, but it yeah. didn't happen. So what it was started, that started. So I, I yeah. put together kind of a few slides that kind of go back to the beginning of when that idea first mm -hmm. hit, which was, I think, in 2014. Um, I had been making sculptures like this, kind of developing this language, really it felt like of shapes. So having this, you know, there's like a rectangle, a 45 degree and a, this half circle. And the, the, it was a compositional method of just having these flat shapes and kind of folding them and rotating them in space and extruding things and cutting things off and combining them. And it kind of felt like they would sort of add up into a bigger meaning altogether. And it felt like I was developing this vocabulary. And then I had the idea of, of a kind of a soloit sort of project of figuring out every possible shape that would exist in a kind of in a grid on this page within that vocabulary and started kind of cataloging these shapes, not sure where it was gonna go. And then thinking, okay, it could be like a book or a wallpaper. And then it ended up, this was the very first animation that I did in 2014 which was done with like a overhead projector and like moving pieces of paper around on a on the overhead projector and then taking a, a you know picture and this is like weeks and weeks of work just to get this very very short little uh, sequence and then i had kind of gotten overwhelmed with that and and sort of shelved it it was just the, like the amount of work that went into just this and kind of i just was like i can't handle this right now uh, but the idea was sort of there, like this kind of shapes in motion was kind of there behind everything I was doing since then. And then a huge thing that I've been talking about since the very beginning too is with the sculptures was um, the feeling of a shape or a form changing as you move around it. And so any one form is kind of like open and then as you turn around it closes and opens again and closes. and people always tell me like they can't even remember the shapes necessarily or the forms that mm -hmm. you know they'll think they've never seen a sculpture in a certain exhibition but then they've actually seen it in my studio or some other like they don't really sink in because they kind of morph around and, and shift around so much so the animation then was like a process of flipping that where you're you're standing still but the thing on the screen is moving and moving mm -hmm. and shifting yeah. and yet somehow we know like it's convinced that it's the same thing for those uh visitors who don't know your sculptural work you know having to go through the space of the projections and emerge on the other side so it, it's that visual association that happens right i think so i yeah. hope i mean you can tell me but i think it's like <laughs> Because I see it everywhere, but yeah. I th you know, it's like th this. This yeah. actual particular shape was kind of where I started that animation, like, and you know, taking that outline and then just thinking, okay, and then, then where is it going to go from there? Like, what's the next move? How is mm -hmm. it going to rotate? And I think through all that, you can you you get out into the space and you can see elements of those shapes in all the work, like on all the flat sides and 
and it starts kind of making sense and also yeah. you realize why the title of the first work lexicon is there to kind of open it up and say mm -hmm. here's here's the visual language that i'm engaged with mm -hmm. And we, we closed the, the door separating this space from the galleries, but the soundtrack is very particular. And you also created that. So what was the thinking behind that and what were you trying to achieve with that? Because it's quite, you know, overpowering. You walk yeah. in and it's not just the images, but the sound is very much, you feel it. It's, it's kind of around you in the same way that the images are. It was more of an intuitive thing of it needing a kind of anchor. Mm -hmm. And I wonder, just based on what you're saying there, if the sound maybe acts a bit like material, mm -hmm. like it gives mm -hmm. it a kind of concrete, yeah. like center presence. Yeah. presence. Mm -hmm. Like it gives it the kind of, yeah, it makes it more convincing as a thing. I knew it, I knew intuitively it needed sound after I finished yeah. it. It was a long process of trying Arriving certain and, things yeah. and, the, you know, a lot of stuff didn't work until I landed on that. Mm -hmm. Let's go to the concrete works next. The concrete works are the earliest works in the exhibitions, works that you made between 2015 and 2019. Um, what was it like to install them and present them uh, in this context? And were there any new revelations about, about them? I'm not sure if there's anything new exactly, <laughs> but it was really a thrill to see them again. Like well, I remember I, yeah. you in the space as we were opening those crates and you say, oh my God, I haven't seen yeah. those in years. They're like and old friends. So, exactly. Yeah. It felt so uh, personal and so, uh, yeah, like that big smile on your face. <laughs> We, we installed the sculpt, the, the concrete works, and then we, uh, we worked on the rest of the show and we came back to the concrete works. So they were kind of the beginning to and the joy. end. <laughs> Surprise, we have They're very heavy, again. yeah. <laughs> and they yeah. require uh, strong, uh, uh, able bodies to, uh, to move them around. But um, I feel like there was, you know, yeah. you were in the space the most and um, while you were installing the other works. And so it, what, what, yeah. The, yeah, the installation of them becomes like the, the experience of viewing them or making them mm -hmm. too, this kind of mo moving things around until something feels like it locks in, you know? And mm -hmm. I think I remember telling you at the, when, while we were installing, I was worried there was too many things mm -hmm. in the space, you know, but it's just a matter of shuffling and switching things. And then it's like, okay, okay, it's perfect. Mm -hmm. Like it, that, I, I, I like how yeah. Jen thing, uh, thought that there were too many things in this space. <laughs> It's, um, if anything, anyone will, will feel challenged by the scale of the space, right? So, right. Uh, but uh, you, you felt like they needed more space. They need space. Yeah. That's the, yeah. like, yeah. the sculpture needs space around yeah. it. This is the first time those works were exhibited in 2016 at Batat in Montreal. Um, and it was kind of the first show I did that I felt like was good. <laughs> There's nothing on the wall, like it's just sculptures in space. I had sort of figured out concrete to a point where I was trusting it, but still discovering things in it. Everything else that's in the show kind of feels like it's rooted in this particular body of work. So yeah. it was a nice anchor like for the rest of the show to kind of jump off from. So this is just a few of the things that were happening before mm -hmm. those concrete works where I was kind of combining it with foam and resin and rocks. And it was just like a lot going on in each form and they were kind of more monolithic. Um, and then with that, that series, Numa like the negative space started to really become part mm -hmm. of the work, which launched into all kinds of other things after that. And then just it, like trusting the concrete, like this gray on gray on gray and like having that be beautiful just yeah. by itself. Those mm -hmm. works are personal to me yeah. in a way, like it, they were at a time when I was working and living in the same space and there was mm -hmm. really no domestic space. It was like complete studio all the time. Um, and it was just like my whole world. Um, so and your first yeah, audience yeah, the first audience <laughs> who um, obviously appreciated the, the perch exactly mm. uh you know and could help with counterbalancing and testing weights <laughs> if it could stand some pressure and the scale of them is like because of that domestic space and my own body and what i could manage and so it was, my apartment was just like full of this stuff all the time mm -hmm. so my next question is about the space and um how it can be a challenge but also an opportunity so um what did you find challenging 
about the space, working on this exhibition, but also what was on the flip side of that, what was rewarding about such a yeah. particular space. <laughs> Particular and, and yeah. big and open, and mm -hmm. I mean, I think it's the biggest space I've ever worked with, mm -hmm. which was very exciting. And the, and the different ceilings things was a decision. Often that there would be a, a dividing wall between mm -hmm. the high ceiling area and the low ceiling area. And um, right from the beginning, I wanted to knock out that wall and kind of bring the daylight in and just have one big open room. And then it was a decision to make that wood piece that kind of highlights that corner in the ceiling. The challenge was conceiving of the thing without being able to actually be in the space working and like trying to de work imaginatively rather mm -hmm. than because I'm such a hands-on person and you know I, when I've done site-specific stuff before it's been here's an empty space and you get a month and do something and I can kind of figure it out as yeah. a, in real scale in real time mm -hmm. so there was a challenge learning how to work with models these are the cardboard models then for the fiberglass pieces um, as I started making them that big scale mm -hmm. they just sort of felt like architecture and it, it was that tension was lost of, of you of the kind of dynamic between you and the thing when you could actually literally enter into it it wasn't right. as exciting like I wanted it to be an object that was like on par with you mm -hmm. um, and getting part of the reason I got a no, no actually no the entire reason I got a studio was because of the show I have mm -hmm. to say <laughs> because this the scale of this place and the scale of my apartment were too far apart and I know I needed to get a little bigger <laughs> I love that. This was trying to figure out the space. Like that, when you're asking challenges of space, it's like the, not being yeah. able to see the thing mm -hmm. in the space. And the closest I could get was just to bring it outside and think, okay, what does it look like with space around it? That as is opposed bigger to, than my studio. Yeah. And the ceiling is kind of not necessarily a visual exactly. um, presence. How important light is to sculpture and to, to presenting it well and to um, making sure that the work has the the presence it needs to have and that the viewer has the experience that is desired. So what do you think about light? And <laughs> it's, I, yeah, Adelina showed me this question yesterday. I thought, oh, really? <laughs> it's often a kind of difficult thing to talk about with galleries and institutions, but there is, of course, everyone has an opinion about it. Um, it's tricky because you, like I make the object, but I often, either I mean partly I don't think necessarily about how it's going to be shown I'm just focusing on the thing um, but then when it comes time to show it it is of course important to have the right context and sculpture totally totally depends on context and like a, a really good piece can only be ultimately as good as its surroundings if it's if it's cramped in a corner with bad lighting and stuff all around it you're not going to really see it like it needs space it needs light these are the fiberglass pieces uh, when we first had them photographed this is how it came out and I thought this isn't, isn't really how they feel in the studio they 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 seem so solid and opaque um, and this is them from a, in, in different lighting conditions in the studio and it feels like completely different objects mm -hmm. um, and there's a sort of um, sense now like in, in that in contemporary art we want to kind of blasted even fluorescent lighting which i i totally love and i'm like all in for that but it is a kind of trend and a we accept it as a sort of default neutral lighting but every every lighting is is adding something or or shifting something there's no such thing as neutral lighting you're kind of mm -hmm. creating the, ob the experience of an object that you want um, and so it was a big decision in the gallery here of how, how to do it. I know I wanted the daylight coming in and then the fluorescence overhead. I think we almost doubled. I asked you to do, like basically yeah. double the amount of fixtures that are normally there. Mm, yes. Um, so it's nice and bright. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and we also lowered the, the, the light grid. Yes. Uh, which we have that ability to do in that uh, double ceiling space. Yeah. yeah. Which brings it down. Yeah. Um, this is another a recent piece where this it, I don't know even know how this picture happened without any shadow at all, <laughs> but it's it's kind of like floating there as this ideal object, and then that is with more direct lighting. But you can really see that it it's like really affects lighting completely affects how you read a thing. Um, and this is the piece that's in the show here where we there are some shadows happening, which was kind of a compromise because the overhead lighting wasn't fully reaching into that corner it was mm -hmm. kind of getting lost in there and the whole point of the piece was to sort of bring the energy back out into the room so it needed a bit of that's the the one instance that where we had spotlights
Yeah. Um, and then your question kind of threw me back to this weird show that I did in 2016 at uh, oh. Center Clark in Montreal. Mm -hmm. um, I was at that point also thinking about lighting and the, that the sort of default neutral kind of matter of factness of the overhead fluorescence. Um, you know, I didn't want kind of dramatic mm -hmm. cinematic lighting that you can get with kind of more direct and cast shadows and stuff. And then I sort of thought that wasn't that overhead lighting wasn't really doing anything for these pieces. And that completely turning the lights off seemed to me to be just as matter of fact as having them completely on. <laughs> And it is, and it, the, the nice surprise was it sort of functioned in the same way that the video room does for me in that it, the, the darkness kind of just changes everything in, in your mental space and you had to kind of slow your pace, wait, your, wait for your eyes to adjust. It was a sort of intimacy with these weird, dark, big forms. Thank you for indulging what sounds maybe like a very technical question, but at the same time is at the heart of what makes a presentation, makes or breaks um, uh, uh, an exhibition or mm -hmm. the, the way a work is presented. And I find that, uh, yeah, at times we don't, or institutions are not always in the position to satisfy those. And I've been mm -hmm. through that in, in different contexts. And uh, uh, I really feel like with your work is essential. And uh, I think we managed to get it as close to what an ideal uh, set of conditions would have been for. And I think that the tension between the natural light that comes through the window and even the conversations we were having about, uh, you know, do we put down the, we have a half of 50% blind and a 100% blind. And the way we tested even kind of the, the change in light and what it did to the entire room, what it did to the experience of the altered cylinders, and it was dramatically different, right? And even in documenting the work, we went through that exercise all over again because the way the camera captures something and the way we look and experience a, a, a work when yeah, it's, it's photographed, totally it's against so different than how it is experienced in person but it's so again that in person experience is so essential and I think your work and the, the materiality the physicality the presence it's you know it has to be presented in the right way in order to to um, to do that and speaking of photography we document of course all our exhibitions but um, in this case we are working on a publication with Jen <laughs> and this is your first uh, uh, publication and it's a uh, it has four texts by different um, authors including one interview and I was just wondering what was like to have that added element to to this experience of making an exhibition but then having those other people respond to to your work in that way and Dan Adler is here today who wrote one of the texts it's amazing it was uh, like working with the, not working with them, but inviting authors to contribute and reading their responses has been really one of the more meaningful experiences I've ever had in a career. It's like, uh, to have someone really pay that close attention mm -hmm. and give that much time and focus to my practice and, and really in depth respond in that way was, was like, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, it felt like, okay, it's landing. It's out. It's yeah felt seen. So we're, we're hoping to have the publication ready um, in the fall, uh, hopefully September, but most likely October. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, we'll, uh, we'll make sure that the world knows about it. One final note, because we've been talking so much about gallery space. Yeah. And yeah. I just wanted to end with a sculpture out in the world, which also is a, a kind of different, entirely different kind of space. And, and a different set of light, light and, conditions. Yeah. 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 And with snow, a different kind of uh, contrasting black and white and um, yeah, dark and light. Exactly. <laughs> yeah.